We're all probably aware at this point that the Gollum video game is just horrible. It's a laughing stock of the internet and it's for good reason. And if you haven't seen my video, please do check it out. I think I did a very good job on it. So if you want to see it, you'll find it in the video description. But for the rest of us, I doubt that anyone would disagree that it feels like it was made by a small team, but it had been sold to us as a AAA title. It had a trailer in the Game Awards. And I believe that there was also a trailer in E3 just before its closure. I do know that they had a booth in EPAC C's just before the release of the game. On a faithful day that it did grace our store shelves, they demanded $80 with two different editions while the most expensive one added only three very bare bone DLCs. Needless to say, it left us shocked, it left us puzzled and demanding answers. So I decided to do my best and compile as much information as I can in this video. That essentially means that we'll be rapidly going through the history of the developer and the publisher, unraveling internal issues, various court cases and even more disputes along the way in order to create a portrait that gives us an idea of why the game was released in the way that it was. With any project, it's never as straightforward as it might seem, and this is just one of those cases where Gollum was probably doomed from the start. First off, I think that it's imperative that we understand what kind of company Diadalic Entertainment was and how they got to making Gollum in the first place. Diadalic was founded in Germany by the following two people on the 1st of March 2007. They started small by releasing their first game called Edna and RV The Breakout. It's about a young girl and her toy rabbit trying to escape an insane asylum and it was a pretty decently reviewed point and click game. Interestingly enough, the game started off as a university project for young Müller and in order to make it, he had to create his own game game engine inside Java. Steam had also refused to publish it on three separate occasions with the assumptions that, and I quote, their target audience wouldn't care about the game. Regardless, it ended up selling pretty well and put them on the map so to speak. I also want to mention that the English translation came a few years later and didn't garner as much praise because it was poorly done. Still, it allowed them to go forward and keep making more point and click games. The following year, they released The Whispered World which sold well enough to warrant a sequel called Silence which sold even better. A year after that, in 2010, they released a sequel to their first game which sold 80,000 copies at the German retailer and reviewed very well across the board. The following year, in 2011, they released Deponia which ended up being their most successful title, garnering up to 4 sequels in a span of 5 years. Additionally, Blackguard released in 2014 and is also another title that brought them a lot of recognition. It didn't sell as many copies as Deponia series but it sold more per unit at a higher cost which means that it was their highest grossing title for the next two years. What's also interesting is that it's not a point and click game, it's actually a turn based strategy game and one that got a sequel which also sold very well. So overall, they were as you can imagine, a very desirable company at the time. Which is why a German company acquired a majority share of 51%. In that same year, they opened a subsidiary company called Diadalic Entertainment West and another four years later in 2018 called Diadalic Entertainment Bavaria. At their peak, they had close to 150 employees and they were pumping out games on a regular basis. Unfortunately, the problems really started out around this time with the publisher having serious financial issues and even considering selling the majority share of the company. In 2021, Didalic closed down both subsidiary companies that opened a few years prior as they weren't really bringing in the goods so to speak. The game releases in this period were few and far between compared to how it was at the start and to make matters worse, they didn't really find an audience. Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth reviewed well but didn't sell well enough. State of Mind reviewed in Mediocrity which in turn reflected its sales. Lastly, you have A Year of Rain which is another strategy game which had poorly reviewed and currently doesn't even have a Wikipedia page for some reason so you can imagine that not much love can went into it in the end. At some point, they probably realized they needed to diversify and ultimately branch out if they wanted to stay in business. In my opinion, that's probably what motivated them in getting access to the portion of the Lord of the Rings license. Then, in March 2019, they announced that they were going to release the product two years after the acquisition. In case you didn't do the math, this game was supposed to release in September 2021, which means that it was supposed to release after just two years of development time. Now, this amount of time should sound alarming to anyone that works or follows the industry. They were a small group that wanted to create something out of their comfort zone, but somehow gave themselves a similar time development as their other endeavors. That leads me to believe that either the scope of the game was smaller at the very start and somehow grew and morphed, or they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. On another note, 
code. I also want to mention I'm not entirely sure of what specific license they got access to. In an interview with Venture Beats done on March 25, 2019, they stated that they wanted to explore Gollum's story before he meets up with the Fellowship as it was uncharted territory. It's barely mentioned in the book, so it allowed them some space to be creative and to invent their own path, so to speak. In the same interview, they only mentioned the book The Fellowship of the Ring, so I presume that they only got the license for that one book. It starts to explain why it contains so many few set pieces that were used in the movies and in other mediums that portrayed the license. In all my research, they never mention the movies or the other books, they just state the license, which is definitely misleading, but sort of makes sense from a marketing standpoint. Also, during an interview at PAX East 2023 with the Iron Lord podcast channel on YouTube, the representative stated that Gollum is an important character in the story of the Lord of the Rings, and one that has a unique perspective compared to everyone else. They also like the power struggle that he has in his own head between Smeagol and Gollum, so all in all, it felt fresh to them compared to what it was on the market at the time. The representative also mentions his survival talents really translate well into the gaming platform. Gollum would have definitely done a lot of platforming in the Misty Mountains, so it makes sense in a way to make a video game out of it. One thing that did change the developer and subsequently the game was their sudden acquisition. Nacon bought all controlling shares of the company for about $60 million, which was finalized in April 2022. To be fair, Gollum was pushed back a few months prior, but the acquisition definitely motivated them in pushing back. Add in the horrible reception of the gameplay trailer and it makes sense why they decided to push it back indefinitely until, well, we basically got our hands on it. I also have no proof of this, but it makes sense to me that Nacon was motivated in buying Didelic because of Gollum. Rings of Power was officially announced in January 2022. There were also other Lord of the Ring games currently in production, so as the IP is sort of reliving a resurgence, it makes sense to me that they would want to gamble on the game's success and get in on the action before the company goes up in value and they miss out on the payload. Now before we come to any conclusions, I have to talk about Nacon because they did publish the game and they probably have a bigger role in this than it meets the eye. The criminally short summary goes as follows. Nacon was created in February 1981 under the name Big Ben Interactive. They owned a bunch of subsidiaries, notably Nacon, which was and still is a gaming accessory company. Over the years, they bought a bunch of licenses and other smaller companies and in February 2020, they decided to merge all of them into one company. That's how Nacon is known today and that merger triggered a desire internally to buy multiple gaming studios. In the following two years, they bought six studios with Diadelic entertainment being the last big one. Now this is where it starts being very interesting and somewhat unrelevant compared to Gollum, so please bear with me for a minute because this will actually be very important at the very end and it will make sense once I'm done with it. During the merger in 2021, Frogware, the devs that made Sinking City and with whom they had a publishing agreement, accused Nacon of not following through with their royalty checks and even at one point being 4 months late on payments and then being on time with their milestones. Nacon also didn't provide the financial charts that Frogware requested, so this all led to a dirty lawsuit case that deserves its own video because it's definitely one for the history books. The gist of it is that it all escalated until Frogware sent a DMCA to Steam asking them to pull their game out of sales. Nacon had owed them so much money, so as they considered that Nacon didn't follow through on their written contract, they decided that gaining any further money from the game's sales wouldn't be beneficial for any of the parties involved. A few months later, Sinking City was back on sale, but to the shock of Frogware, it was done without their consent. They believe that Nacon, feeling betrayed and stating that they own all the assets, including the license, proceeded to buy a copy of the game on Games Planet. They pirated it and changed the logos and copyright information before making it available on Steam once more. That essentially means that Frogware was, and still is, accusing Nacon of license and asset theft, while also stealing the developer's activation key that, in other words, allows them access to the source code of the game. Nacon replies that Frogware is actively making the distribution of the game difficult. If you're interested in hearing more about this ridiculous story and actually seeing proof that Nacon's made public, you'll find it all in my video description. By the way, if you also want me to make a video on Sinking City, please let me know in the comments below because honestly, I think it would be a really interesting video and I do like Sinking City as a whole. Anyways, they sent the cease and desist to Steam, which took the game out of sales for a long time and not much has come out of it in court except one thing. You can buy the game now on your online platform of choice because the courts ruled that Frogware was in the wrong for pulling the game out of store shelves in the first place. That counts as them infringing on their contract as Nacon is allowed to sell the game they paid to publish. Even if I couldn't find any proof 
that they paid the 1 million euros that they presumably owed? Regardless, in order to not keep the game hostage from both sides, it was allowed to be put back on sale until a final verdict was determined in court. When would that happen and why wasn't the rest judged at the same time? Is honestly beyond me. But. It is what it is, I guess. Now, you might be wondering why I went through a court case faster than Roadrunner about a game now relevant to Gollum, and the answer is actually pretty simple. I think that the publisher has more to Gollum than meets the eye. This court case is just one example. The devs that made Paranoia Happiness is mandatory are also suing Nacon. The publicly made story goes as the game wasn't in a state fit for release. Both owners of the IP told Nacon that the game shouldn't be released because of all the minor and game-breaking bugs they found. They asked for more dev time, and Nacon ignored them and proceeded to publish the game regardless. They obviously got pissed off, sent a cease and desist each, and are now bringing Nacon to court. This year, on July 11, 2023, Kylo Town went on strike after only being acquired five years prior because they stated that working conditions have not been improved. They've stated their concerns on multiple occasions but felt ignored by Nacon, so after a meeting that went from bad to worse, the company went on immediate strike. Add in the multiple shitty releases that they published in the last few years, and it's hard to feel like the devs at Diadelic Entertainment are the only ones to blame here. Making games is hard work, and during the hate train fiasco that was Gollum, some of the devs publicly stated that they were actually proud of the game. No one sets out to make a bad game, but circumstances that are often out of their control makes it turn out the way that it does, and it's hard to deny that everything wasn't against them. Diadalic was somewhat dying when they got the license. They needed to branch out so they probably took more than they could handle and their savior ended up being a company who are going through their own issues. Until all court cases and disputes are resolved and we get the final verdicts, I'll reserve my judgment and just state that Nacon, to the very least, isn't the publisher that they need it. We also haven't received any testimony from the devs or Nacon or from any outside journalists, so we can't with all certainty point fingers at someone and decide that everything is on this specific group of people because it's far more complicated than that. What is definitely sure is the aftermath of Gollum. Diadelic Entertainment released a JPEG apology and went to work on the sequel. They rapidly got the boot, shutting down the project and subsequently the studio. 25 out of a total of 90 employees lost their jobs and even if Diadelic stated that they'll try to keep them somehow in the company, they haven't stated how or shown it so they're probably gone at this point. On the other hand, Diadelic still live on as a publishing brand and even if they try to spin it in a positive light by stating that they're publishing 8 games by the end of this year, I don't see how they'll be able to recover from this. The real cost of Gollum is the future of the company and the people who took part in the project. Long gone are the days where they used to make games that people played and looked forward to the sequel. 25 devs now have to find a new job in this fucked up economy with, well, Gollum being the last thing that they worked on. As for Nacon, well, it's honestly just business as usual. Their net revenue has increased compared to the last year and they're projecting even more profits to come, so they remain unaffected in general. It's honestly pretty sad because no matter how much involvement they had in all four companies that I mentioned, they seem to get out of it scot-free. Now, does it mean that my opinion of Gollum has changed and that you should run to the store and get it? <laughs> Not a fucking chance. A shit game is unacceptable, no matter how you spin it. When people are offered to purchase a product, it needs to be up to a certain standard. It needs to be able to compete with the rest of the market, and I can't imagine a single scenario that I would recommend Gollum over another game. But at the end of the day, I think that it's important that we remember that these games are made by people that they did what they could with the cards that were dealt to them. I also received a comment on my Gollum video from a user that stated that Nacon wouldn't pay for any overtime hours, hired mostly inexperienced people to make it, and that the CEO left the company, but unfortunately I didn't find any substantial proof that confirms these claims, which is why I left it on the side until now. Judging by the fact that he bought a lot of companies in such a short time, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Anyways, the one thing that I'm sure of is that I sincerely wish the best to all the Diadelic's previous and current staff, and I hope that to the very least, we'll try to remember Diadelic by the games that they made them who they are, and not the games that took their future away even if it's honestly pretty naive of me to think so. And well, that's the end of that, I guess. That's where the story ends. So thank you for watching my video. I hope you found it interesting and I hope to the very least it gave you a new perspective on the situation. I hope that this in some way gives you closure and makes you understand a little bit more how the industry works because at the end of the day, I mean, we're all trying to do our best, right? So thank you for watching my video. Do like and subscribe if you liked it and uh, I hope to see you in the next one. <laughs> Bye now.